Hello friends, my name is Deepak and with me is Sanjeev Gupta CPA and today we have a very interesting topics that uh, people are always curious about. All of us travel to India, you know, some of us perhaps more than once per year if you're Sanjeev Gupta CPA, but uh, many of us only travel once a year. And we always wonder what should we do in India? What are some of the things that we should deal with? Because if we don't take care of those issues, they can come back and bite us later on or cost us extra because then we have to go back to take care of those things. So I thought maybe I talked to Sanjeevji today and uh, kind of dissect that part of our life. You know, if you're traveling to India, maybe for vacation, for business, whatnot, what are some of the important aspects that we should pay attention to? So I'm going to be asking a lot of questions to Sanjeevji about that. But before I begin, let me remind you guys that on November 10th, we are having our annual Wealth Summit. So those of you guys who haven't been to Wealth Summit, I would strongly urge you to go to sanjeevcpa.com and take a look at some of the pictures from the last Wealth Summit. It's a wonderful event from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. We talk about estate planning, financial planning, tax planning, uh, high income planning, people who have capital gain problems, people who have you know property sales, people who are sending money to India, bringing money to India, people who are uh, uh, growing, people who are expanding their companies, maybe adding new branches, people looking for opportunities. People always come, what should I do? What, how can I grow wealth? We talk about that. Uh, asset protection. Like it's a one day event where we talk about all kinds of issues related to our finances. Educational event, but more importantly, you get to meet with a lot of professionals. I will be there whole day long. Sanjeev will be there whole day long. Our entire team, you can imagine we have 25 people here in the office every single one of them will be at the Wealth Summit, meaning you have so many people that you can ask your questions to. In addition to that, we will also have an estate planning attorney there, we will have a corporate attorney there, we will have financial planners there, we will have wealth management people there, we'll have real estate people there, we'll have banker people there, we'll have people who can help you with your HELOC, people who can help you with your uh, uh, mortgage, people who can help you with refinance. I mean, you talk about all kind of finance related problems, we will have solutions for you at this Wealth Summit. So I urge all of you guys to please register for the Wealth Summit. Now, for this month, just uh, we are in September, so I think somewhere around maybe towards to the middle of October or whatnot, we will have a Diwali Mela here in Bay Area. And with Wealth Summit registration right now, we're giving away four free tickets to that Diwali Mela. So that's a $40 value. You get that absolutely free if you register. How do you register? Go to sanjeevcpa.com and click on Wealth Summit and buy uh, your Wealth Summit ticket with Diwali Mela and that's all you have to do. Rest. Sanjeev ji is very kind. He will take care of your parking. Uh, there's a lot of parking there. He will take care of your breakfast. He'll take care of your lunch uh, and he will probably give you a brain freeze with all kind of information. You'll get that. <laughs> all right. So that's, uh, that's about Wealth Summit. So Sanjeev ji, thank you for taking some time out today. I want to talk to you about what should we do when we go to India? What's like, like if there is one thing that people should do, what would that be? So first thing is look at their PAN cards and Aadhaar cards. Okay. That's the most important thing. Now, people who have come from there, when they came, came over here, they were not US citizens, most probably. They, were, they might be on different kind of visas or they might have, have got a green card. Then they convert to US citizenship. So when they come over here, they are still an Indian citizen. And when they are Indian citizen, they have they are issued Aadhaar card, which was compulsory, mandatory for all Indian citizens. Uh, PAN card was PAN card is a num is an account is a card which has permanent account number which is meant for financial transactions. Aadhaar card is for everything like a social security number in the US. So if you have that Aadhaar card and you came over here and then you become a US citizen, technically you, you should not uh, have that Aadhaar card. You should be you should give up that Aadhaar card, but you should have a PAN number. PAN number is meant for any financial transaction. So if you do if you do any transaction in India more than two lakh rupees, you need a PAN permanent account number. You don't need an Aadhaar card. So if you have Aadhaar card, it's better for you to give it up. If you have PAN number and you have PAN number before marriage, after marriage, or came over your multiple PAN cards, uh, it's better to uh, to uh, give that PAN card back and use that PAN card which is valid. So so number one, Aadhaar card and look at your PAN card. Look at your Aadhaar card status, how is it goes, and based on that, you can move on. And a couple of other points I will add to that as well is Aadhaar card and PAN card is great, 
But then you also have bank accounts in India. You have mobile accounts. You know, maybe you have some sort of cell phone service with some carrier. Make sure those are linked because a lot of transactions in India that you do these days, Sanjeevji, is linked with your phone. Everybody wants to send you an OTP. So that brings another important factor when it comes to India. Have an Indian mobile number. You should have that Indian mobile number because if you're trying to do transaction in India, they send OTP on the, only on the Indian mobile number. Sometimes they don't have the connection to U.S. numbers. So have that uh, validated uh, the, the mobile number. And coming to talking about the banks, it's important that the second thing you can look at is updating your KYC. Know your customer. It's very important. A lot of people ignore it totally. So bank has a lot of, lot of things we have for bank accounts. But the main important thing is update your KYC with your driver license, with your social security number, where, where you're residing in, your phone numbers. Uh, make sure all the the bank have the relevant all the relevant information. If they don't have relevant relevant information, if something goes wrong, maybe you're not there or you're giving to spouse or whatever, it will be a nightmare for them to access those funds. So always, whenever you go there, first thing is to look at the other card and update them. Of course, you can also apply for e pen. You can always do the e pen card. Uh, then look at your bank accounts and do the KYC. KYC is very important to update, to make sure that the bank has the relevant information. And, you know, when you're in the U.S., especially if you're a business owner, general recommendation from me and Sanjeev is build a relationship with few bankers, maybe three or four. Because if you have those banker relationships, it makes it easy for you to get mortgages, to get business loans, you know, all kind of credit that we need. But if you're not living in India, and you have bank accounts with four or five different banks, it becomes way too much time consuming to manage all that. So perhaps think about streamlining those bank accounts. Maybe you only have a relationship with one bank or two banks, and maybe those banks are closer to your place wherever you normally visit, and you know the bank, bank manager. That means he, you have their cell phone number, you're able to communicate with them. It will make your life so much easier versus if you, if you have like you know, five six different, different banks, like Sanjeev said, updating KYC for each bank becomes ridiculous. Just mm. it, it just takes too much time. So it, think about streamlining it. Yeah. So in addition to that, so the question that normally people do come come and ask is, where should I open a bank account? So never open. If you are coming over here, trying and you are staying here for a long time, always keep and you are tra and transferring money back and forth. So uh, it's better to go with the nationalized banks, bigger banks. Don't go with community banks. Don't go with local banks. They don't have that facility. Go with that bank, which has I, which is which I said, very good IT services, which has foreign foreign transactions, and deal with them. So that is easy for you to move money around. So so always go with the bank which has all those uh, facilities. So do update, uh, do look into that, and try to close all the other smaller accounts. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, because it, it's, it's your your PAN number, Aadhaar card will be linked to that account too. So maybe you get an IT uh, IT department notice from the saying, oh, you know, we see the transaction there. So just be aware of that. And another part of uh, banking is taxation. You might have some money sitting in the bank account that is earning interest rate. Maybe you have a DMAT account and you're investing in stocks or mutual funds. So I want to break that down, Sanjeevji, because obviously that's a big part of it. Maybe you have rental properties, you're collecting rent from your Indian properties and whatnot. So maybe take a moment and explain to people what kind of tax consequences these people have so, with all these accounts. So uh, you said a very well, valid point here, the DMAT account. So that's the third important part. So a lot of people have transactions, they do, they have brokerage accounts, they do transaction debt. So it's always better to convert the DMAT account to an RO. Demand account, non resident uh, demand account. You need to convert that. That's a, that's a FMR regulations, that's a RBI regulation. You cannot transact business in a demand account under residency regulations. Can't do that. So, conversion is very important to a, uh, to, to a non resident demand account. Now, coming to taxation of different, uh, different income aspects, well, let's start with the bank deposits, bank interest. So, when, when we look at the Bank interest income, first thing is people have a lot of bank accounts and they never convert to an RO and RE account. Never. They continue doing this on this as a regular checking, saving, or they do all kinds of CDs in under regular account. That's also a violation of PEMA. That's also a violation of RBI regulation and also a violation of income tax rules in India. 
So remember this, if you are outside India, there are three types of regulations. RBI regulation, FEMA requirements, income tax regulations. So if you are outside India for more than six months in a year, you become a non-resident from FEMA requirement, RBI regulation. But you don't become a non-resident from income tax rules in India. There are certain rules there that you have to be out for more than a 730 days rule, 9 out of 10 years rule. So your status changes based on that requirements. So, so watch out for that. But you have to follow when you open a bank account, you have to follow not the tax rules, but you have to follow the FEMA requirements and RBI regulations because that governs those, those accounts. So it's important for you, if you have been here for a long time, it's better for you to convert your resident account to non-resident rupee account, which is out, which is rupee in and rupee out. You put the rupee in, you take the rupee out, or you can convert it to non-resident external rupee account and RE account. You put dollars in, you can not put rupee in, you have to put the dollars in, and you can take out dollars or rupee out. Okay, it's based upon you. But the NRE is meant for repatriation, and now it's not meant for repatriation because it's a rupee account. Of course, you can also open an FCNR account, foreign currency uh, resident account, non-resident accounts, which are based on to which maintains your your money in foreign currency. So any devaluation will not have impact on that FCNR valuation. So you can open that one. The interest rate that is that is there when it comes to a non-resident rupee account, another account is the same as as as, as a resident. Uh, a CD account, so there is no difference in that one. When it comes to a NARI account, the the interest rate is still is little off and here and there, but still better uh, than an NR, NRO account. FCNR, of course, is a two three percent depends upon the international market and whatnot. So uh, it's important that uh, we do this. Uh, look into that uh, that um, that that account. Sorry, about that. that account. Uh, so, if you are an NRO account, uh, the interest that you earn on the city is subject to tax rules as per the, the, the residency requirements. Means you have to pay taxes in India, you have to file a return in India for that. There might be TDS on that account uh, taken out. Uh, TDS can be 15%, it can be 30%. Depends upon what you are doing. You might need a residency certificate, tax exemption residency certificate from here, provide to the banks. Or you can have there are certain forms that you fill up 15H, 15G, or 15I that that you can use to, uh, to lower their TDS. But remember that income needs to be reported here, and you pay the same ordinary tax rate that is applicable to your local income here, when it, uh, with respect to income that you earn from outside. Now another part of it is uh, Sanjeevji. A lot of people have real estate properties in India as well. So it makes sense for you to take a look at what's happening with the real estate. For example, a lot of uh, people are buying flats in communities. So pay attention to your bills that might be passed due there. Uh, also pay attention to your deeds in India. That's also important. And uh, and then anything else that might be coming around those properties. So a lot of time people buy these properties, but they don't really visit them and somebody else is managing them. So we're seeing a lot of uh, issues come out of that. And if you're planning on selling that property, then it also makes sense to kind of do your due diligence and set up a consulting appointment and figure out how does that process going to look like? How are you going to sell that property? How are you going to bring that money back? Uh, all that kind of good stuff. So that's another thing we should look into it. So anything on yeah, real estate? So, so real estate, before I go to most uh, real estate, I was the bank, when it comes to interest income on bank account, still we are not covered the non-resident external rupee. And the interest that you make in on that account, which is a dollar in and rupee and dollar out account, you don't pay any taxes in India on that income because it's exempt from taxes. But you have to show that income here on the US tax return. You're subject to federal taxes and you're subject to state taxes on that income as well. Now, if, if it's an interest income on another account, you, you pay tax in India, you get a credit for a tax you pay here on that income, but not from the state. California does not have provide for any kind of credits on the state, on the income from fund sources. Now, when it comes to FCNR account, the interest is, again, exempt from taxes, but you have to show it here. On the, now, coming to real estate, the first thing we should look into real estate is the title. The title of the deed. Do you do change the title in your current name or is it still in your old name? Did you update? Did you, do, uh, you change the, all the documents, all the deeds related to your new name, if you have a new name, or before marriage, after marriage name. 
Uh, so definitely that needs to be uh, done in India. Have, there is a process that we, we call it. You have, to, you have to follow that process with the local 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 uh, uh, municipal corporations. Uh, update those those records. If you if you have got an apartment, if you have an apartment in a society or cooperative housing society or something, and you have a share certificate, you need to update that share certificate with the with the current information so that the society has that information on file. If something goes wrong, or is if you have to sell that apartment, it's not going to be tough for you. Otherwise, society or apartment complexes uh, union union can take a lot of time in doing that paperwork. So do that paperwork correctly. Uh, so that all the other th things are, are done properly. And if you have any kind of a trust in India, if you have a trust, you establish a trust in India, make sure the trust has all the current information like we do here. But the trust in case something goes wrong. Because the trust is also valid. If you have a will, update the will, uh, uh, register the will in India, including all the real estate. Now, when you sell the real estate, of course, we know that we have to pay, we have to show, we have to see at both times. The changes uh, in India, the changes have been there with respect to sale of property by non residents. You're not subject to, uh, you, you, do, you can't take any benefit of indexing. Um, the tax rate have decreased from 20% to 12.5%. It benefit only those people, those non residents who have who have hold the property for longer term, not for shorter term. But shorter term, you benefit from, uh, from lower interest rates, uh, lower tax rates. But you have to remember, you have to show that gain also on the US tax returns. And then you will be subject to federal and state taxes. Of course, you will get credit. How much credit you will get will depend on the Form 1160 that we that we use uh, when we do your tax returns. And another uh, common issue I see, Sanjeevji, is a lot of people have insurance policies in India, yes. LICs or yes. some other stuff there. And many of these policies might not be even valid because these people are living outside the country these days. And they're not uh, telling the insurance company that they're living outside. Right. So at the bare minimum, if you don't do anything else, try to get an answer to that. Hey, is this policy even valid? Because I don't live in India anymore. Maybe right. you're just wasting your money. Like, it, like it, they, you'll never be able to collect on that policies. If something goes wrong, they will do an investigation. Of course, the insurance company will not just pay the money. They will, try to, they will do their own due, due diligence. And if they find out you violated the regulations, the, the, the terms of, of the policies, they may not pay you. So it's, oh, it's a very good point, by the way. It's, insurance policy needs to be updated with all the relevant information. And look, check your insurance policy and tell them that you are outside here. You are living outside or you are a US citizen or a green card holder so that they can update the, their, their things properly. And similarly, just like the uh, policies, then you also have health insurance. So I know if you're living in US, you probably have a health insurance from US. That's fine. But there are great health insurance policies available for your parents, for anybody you take care of in India. Um, so if they don't already have one, maybe look into a plan. You know, in India, they even offer policies for seniors. Right. And they're really good policies. Yeah, so now coming to the part of the parent, you have to see, we are here, right? And parents are mostly there in India. So we have to take care of them in the best possible manner. Maybe you can have services that are there that can assist them. When you are not there for them, so even if you go for high good services, don't worry about payment. Make sure that they get the right service. Uh, they don't feel your absence. Of course, emotionally, of course, they will feel it. But since there's a time lag, time difference, make sure that you make them you sign up for their services, for proper services for them when they need them. That's number one. Number two, if you're looking to sponsor the green card for them. Uh, make sure that you understand the regulation with respect to compliance here. You have to disclose the interest income, you have to include, include, uh, disclose their pension, if they get pension, you have to disclose their PPF. If you have interest from PPF, you have to disclose the rental income, which we talked, which we did not talk, but is our, it's important. Uh, so rental income needs to be reported here. That will impact their medical, medical insurance here, because if they have substantial income, of course, they will not get any kind of Medicare or Medi-Cal unless they get a U.S. citizenship and then they, they, their age passes 65, then they can get kind of a Medicare. But till that time, they have to get expensive Medicare. So remember all those things, plan all those things. Now coming to health insurance, like you said, if the parents have health insurance properly, if they carry, there are a lot of health insurance companies which provide 
very good health insurance facilities in India. Make sure if they, you have that right coverage because again, a lot of times we are not able to go there when they need us. So make sure that health insurance will come into play a big, big part. What What is there inside the health insurance? Look in those policies. If they demand a good premium, high premium, pay them because that's for your parents. And it's, and it's, it's, it's actually very reasonable in India. So I, I found that... Help. Health insurance is actually not bad at all. But it's you good. should update the yeah. premiums. Uh, keep paying on time. Keep uh, keep that policy in effect. Yeah. And, and, you know, before I forget also, all the things that we talked about, we're talking about it from your point of view. But maybe you want to look at all of these points from your parents' point of view as well. You know, if something happens to them, how are you going to manage those affairs? So you need to pay attention to them as well. You know, for example, power of attorney. You know, you should have a power of attorney so that way people in India can manage your affairs and you should have power of attorney from them so you can manage their affairs. So, you know, pay attention to that. As simple as knowing where all the bank accounts are, where all the properties are, where what accounts they have. Many times people don't even know. Yes. Uh, and then something happens and now they're trying to figure all that stuff out. It becomes ridiculously, you're already going through a difficult time and now you've got to figure all that out. It becomes really, really hard. So keep uh, keep track of that. Pay attention to security as well. Yeah. That's another big issue I see because especially if you're, you know, elderly parents there and even for yourself in India, that can be an issue. So figure out how can you do some risk mitigation around that. I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of stories. So those were all my notes. Um, we talk about health insurance. We talk about life insurance. We talk about your real estate. We talk about your bank accounts. We talk about your PAN card. We talk about your Aadhaar card. Um, those are the some key elements that I think we should uh, we should pay attention to. Anything else you want to add to that, Sanjeev? Well, well, the thing is, when we travel, when you go and uh, travel to Europe, when you go back and forth and traveling, remember that uh, when you go to the immigration, the customs and immigration, make sure that you follow the rules of how much uh, you can bring and how much you can take out from there. Uh, that's also important because uh, people try to bring a lot of cash from there or a lot of jewelry from there or bring jewelry from here to there. So there are regulations with respect to customs. So follow, be be careful, be 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 updated with all those uh, all those things in mind. So that's also important. And last but not the least, uh, your siblings out there. Uh, parents is one area and siblings out there too. So. If you are really attached to your siblings uh, or if you want to take care of them, maybe you can look into that aspect as well. Yeah. And what Sanjeev Ji said about uh, this whole uh, travel problems, right? So here's another one I see Sanjeev Ji every now and then. People may, for example, maybe you check the regulations from India point of view. And let's say you have three stopovers before you come to the U.S. Just because you meet the regulation in India doesn't mean you oh, yeah. meet the regulation all the way to the U.S. Yes, yes, you yes, know. Yes. Dubai has different regulations. London has a different regulation. U.S. has a different regulation. So just be careful which countries you're crossing the borders. And even though your final destination is U.S., you know, for example, you know, let's say in U.S., you can carry up to $10,000 without having to worry about it. But in India, that's a different rule. In Dubai, it's a different rule. And in Europe, it will be a different rule. Same thing applies to gold. Same thing applies to uh, all kind of other things. You know, some people think like, you know, they can carry whatever jewelry they want. So watch out for that. That can, that can get because, you in trouble. Yeah, that's the important area because once we cross, we, we, are, we always try to follow the green line, green channel. I'm thinking nobody will see it, but beware, the customs and custom officials are there, Indian customs and also U.S. customs, they know, they can see your expression on the face and they can find out who is guilty, who is not guilty. So be careful on that rule as well. Yeah. And let's just say if some, if you do make a mistake and something does go wrong, maybe you forgot or whatnot, the best advice I can give you is never lie of to course, customer officers. Of course. They are government agents. Uh, you cannot do a lie. Yeah. And don't bring pickles or mangoes or anything <laughs> from India. Yeah. There's plenty of those available here in the U.S. <laughs> these days. And because particularly the dogs are trained. <laughs> the dogs are trained to uh, get the smell. <laughs> Yeah. And they'll say, what is this going on? Then they'll, yeah, they'll check it out. Yeah. So anyhow, th those are the things that you should really pay attention to next time you are traveling to India. If you if we miss something, then put it in a comment and we'll try to address it in the next video. But we're so excited to see you guys all at the Wealth Summit. It's only a one month away, one of the biggest events that we do. So so please, if, uh, if you have never attended for 
definitely come check it out. And um, if you have attended several times in the past, we promise to do something new. Yes. We, we try our best of course. <laughs> to, to add something else, uh, to bring new information, something that can help you move, make some progress in your wealth building process. Uh, this is very important because we are working hard to make money, but we don't make money work for us. Yep. So this is a this is a, this is a summit where money will. If you know the concepts, the money will work for you in the right. All right, guys, thank you so much once again. The the link to register is just sanjeevcpa.com. Just go there and register. If you want to get hold of me, uh, very simple. You can you know call our office five one zero eight two five seven five six three. If you want to set up an appointment with Sanjeev you can do it on the website or call that number and uh, meet with him. We have four offices here in the Bay Area, so you can go to any one of those four uh, to meet with us, all right? Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.